Today we are going to have one of the climaxes of this uh, uh, class. Uh, uh, that is, we are wrapping up the neoclassical uh, uh, take on uh, why nations grow or what explains the per capita income differences across the world. I will uh, make a very quick uh, summary of uh, uh, what we had distilled uh, thus far and then set the stage for the uh, endogenous leap uh, uh, forward. <coughs> and during the interim, we are going to also uh, uh, make a uh, brief overview of alternative exogenous growth uh, modeling, uh, neo-Ricardian, neo-Keynesian, uh, uh, and uh, neo-Marxian uh, takes. And then we are going to proceed with uh, the uh, endogenous uh, uh, aspects of growth modeling. Before we continue, anything I should be aware of? Anything that that bothers you? That's easy. Uh, <laughs> the, all right. Uh, well. <clears throat> All right. Uh, <clears throat> now I hope uh, the mechanics of the neoclassical undertaking is clear. As long as there is a net positive profit rate, there are incentives that we partially modeled, we, we partially we had not, but logically. We understood that uh, the main driver of the economy is capital accumulation, capital investment. And what sets uh, capital investment in motion is savings. We have used fixed, exogenously given fixed savings out of growing income. Uh, it did not uh, uh, had to be so. Uh, we could endogenize the uh, behavior of savings through intertemporal optimization, consumption smoothing, uh, interest rate smoothing, whatever fancy word uh, uh, that you can uh, think of. So the fact that exogenous take of uh, fixed savings is not much of a uh, big deal. Uh, we can uh, always endogenize it. What is important is the fact that the production function is of diminishing returns to capital. And as long as you equate the marginal product of capital with the profit rate, and since the marginal product of capital is subject to diminishing returns, then that means profit rate is also, since it is equated with the marginal product, it's also diminishing. In Marx and in all classicals, profit rate has a tendency to fall over time. In Marx, as you will see, or as you might have seen, or as you will be seeing in your history of economic thought courses or uh, some other material, in classicals and in Marx too, there is a tendency for the falling rate of profit, but due to entirely different reasons, due to the rise in the organic composition of capital, the fact that there is a excessive uh, capital uh, accumulation, which restricts this value of surplus that is uh, created out of uh, uh, labor uh, uh, exploitation. Whatever the mechanism is, both classicals and neoclassicals uh, model a diminishing return for the return to capital. And that is the underlying reason for the so-called convergence and the steady state. Now, uh, since capital accumulation is the ultimate source of growth under the, uh, the neoclassical world, we played around with it. We said, OK, but what makes capital to accumulate? And uh, loosely speaking, we had thought of two motives. One is uh, what I will call the Karajolan motive. That is uh, art, namus, sila. That's con consumption. We are in this world to consume. That is what Homo economicus is about. This animal 
called Homo economicus, maximizes consumption per labor over time. And just for the fun of it, we thought of maximizing something else. Since at the end of the day, you know that uh, <coughs> the consumption per labor is defined as 1 minus the saving rate times output. So anything that is not saved is consumed. And the end result of this uh, operation was the fact that uh, the first derivative of the uh, per capita production function, which is the marginal product of capital, has to be equal to delta if you want to maximize per capita consumption over time, which meant that the net profit rate has to be 0. All returns for net profitability of capital has to be exhausted. And it makes sense. It basically says that uh, if everyone does whatever they have to do properly, if I call capital owner as the owner of capital which accumulates, the capital owner has to accumulate until the point where there are no further gains for further accumulation. Profit rate must, must be zero. If workers' job is to work along with capital in a production function, which is neoclassical, substitutable, admitting uh, uh, continuous derivatives, so on and so forth, then all wage income, all labor, has to be consumed. All labor income has to go to consumption. If wage income is diverted away from consumption to savings and capital accumulation, then the model uh, gets blurry. Workers had to work and consume. Capitalists uh, have to save and invest and accumulate capital. There should be no uh, blurring of uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, of responsibilities and roles. Hani diyoruz ya, the central bank has only one objective, one instrument, one thing uh, that's uh, everyone believes on this thing. It's that sort of a thing. Well, uh, just to play around with this idea, uh, <laughs> a few uh, heterodox economists wanted to make fun of it, uh, uh, as Frank Thompson had uh, led the way. We we might imagine another motive to maximize, which is profits. Maximize total profits per labor. Pi is total profits. And total profits per labor is simply the profit rate returns to capital, gross profit rate, including depreciation, times capital per labor. So maximize this. Buyurun, gelin. Telaş etmeyin. And the uh, solution to this problem had been that uh, the second derivative times capital per labor plus the first derivative must be equal to delta. Now, uh, since this is another rule, just for the sake of giving names and clarifying the distinction, uh, for no serious or uh, uh, political intentions, we call this the golden rule of accumulation, and we call this the golden age of capital, or capitalists. You can simply uh, say, as I had that loosely, this one, the Karajolan rule, this one, the uh, uh, Yavuz Sultan Selim rule. You know, just uh, uh, whomever, uh, however you want to differentiate. But you have to know what is the main mechanism. So if this is uh, a golden rule, per capita consumption maximizing uh, 
solution, then uh, I'm just going to put a GR under, well, no, not here, uh, under these to indicate that these belong to different, uh, no, not here, sorry. This is the definition of the problem. These are the solutions. So these are the optimal capital labor ratios that satisfy the respective objective functions. The capital labor ratio distinguished as GA, the golden age, is different than the capital labor ratio that solves the problem of consumption maximizing and is distinguished as golden rule. <coughs> then uh, we examined these two behavioral uh, 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 functions and noted that this f double prime is inherently assumed to be negative. That is the diminishing returns assumption. So since this is true, this value over here is intrinsically negative. So if I move this f prime, evaluate it at the golden age capital labor ratio, okay, this f prime and this f prime are evaluated at different capital labor ratios. They are different numerical values. This one is equal to delta. This one is equal to delta minus f double prime k time k evaluated at GA. And this f prime is inherently negative, negative times negative. So this is, together with this negative sign, is delta plus something. Meaning that, meaning that this f prime, thus f prime, evaluated at GA, this F prime, delta plus something is greater than this F prime evaluated at GR. If you put in numbers as in your homework, you will see that uh, for any solution of whatever the number value, you will see this uh, automatically. Because we have assumed so. We have assumed a diminishing returns uh, production function. That means the more capital we use, the less is F prime. The less capital we use, the higher is F prime. So to continue that story, if the marginal product of capital evaluated at golden age turns out to be higher than the marginal product of capital evaluated at golden rule, then it must be true that uh, it must be true that uh, capital at golden age should be capital at go golden rule. The more capital you use, the less is its margin product. The less capital you use, the higher is the margin product. Margin products and the values work uh, in alternate ways. It, if this is also true, then uh, that means under the respective set steady states, the saving rate associated with golden age must have been less than the saving rate associated with the golden rule. There is less capital because I have saved less. There is less capital, thus the marginal product of capital must be higher. Any ambiguity on these ideas? Any scratches? Herhangi bir kırışıklık? Any blurry? All right, let's, let's, let's check on this. Uh, uh, this is a... 
this is a trivial matter. So uh, as a uh, geometrical summary, let's put all these things together. This is output per labor given along a production function. This is capital per labor. Now, uh, I want you to relax for a moment. Just relax back. Just watch the sequence of these things rather than uh, copying. And I will let you, uh, uh, as much as you want, to copy uh, what's on the, on the board. But first, uh, just watch how this thing uh, is uh, running. Uh, because the sequence of, <coughs> of ideas is important, uh, or the sequence of events, rather. The sequence of events is important to understand the main idea. One, we start from a, a delta k ray. Uh, given, this is first givens. We are also given a production function, f of k. That's the second step. We have two givens. The idea is to choose a capital labor ratio to maximize consumption. This is the question. What explains per capita income differences in a world that is everyone is trying to maximize consumption per labor? The solution is this. All right. But uh, we are choosing a capital labor ratio. Therefore, we are choosing a saving rate that maximizes consumption under the steady state. Remember, we are doing this under uh, long run equilibrium, under steady state. What is the solution? Well, the solution is the derivative of f, forget about economics. Let's be an arithmetician for a moment. The derivative of this production function f must be equal to a ray delta. So the slope of this delta must be uh, the same as the derivative of the uh, production of the function, which is approximated by a line, which is tangent. And I take the slope of it, ta 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 ta. ta. So uh, if you take that thing, this is indeed the maximize consumption per labor. So uh, this is f prime, and I want to equate it to the slope of the ray. See, that's, the, that's why it's important to work in steps. Give me a ray and give me a, a function. I am going to instantly tell you the consumption maximizing <laughs> capital labor ratio that I have called golden rule. And it, it, it indeed maximizes this I-shaped uh, difference, which tells me the difference between savings and the function. How do I impose this? By making sure that S times f of k is using the golden rule saving rate. And that is my, if this is my third step, find me the capital labor ratio that maximizes, that satisfies f prime equals delta rule. Which one of these capital labor ratios enable me that? This particular one. Now, step number three. Well, how do I get it? To get it, choose a saving rate that guarantees that the S times F of K, that is the investment function, intersects with the depreciation function. Because I have to satisfy 
all the time this rule. That is my stability rule. That is my steady state rule. So I am choosing S such that the derivative of this function is equal to delta. So that's the fourth step over here. This is the solution of this problem. I don't want to create a mess, and I'm not good at uh, uh, drawings, so it will be a very easy task for me to do so. But for you, just to impress your friends at the engineering departments or your fine arts uh, friends, extend this ray. The derivative of the, this thing will be equal to gross profit rate, which being equal to delta indicates that net profit rate will be 0. And you go there. This portion will be equal to profits. This portion will be equal to wages. And when you uh, extend this ray over here, the amount of wages here will be equal to what? Suppose I extend this ray, f prime, as we had done before. This point to origin 0. This is equal to the wage rate, wages per labor. At the golden rule steady state, it should be equal to something on this picture. It should be equal to this distance. So if you do this properly, by the proper choice of delta and uh, uh, derivatives, etc., this ray to the tangent partitions total output, which will be this much. This is the output golden rule. This much will be total profits, gross profits, net profit zero. All of these profits go and finance depreciation. There are no further net profits here. And this portion is wages per labor, wage rate, and it should be exactly equal to consumption per labor. Wages go to consumption, profits go to gross investment. Total gross profits, total wages per labor. And this must be equal to C over N. This is the analysis of the first exercise. And uh, all right, just copy the first part. Any questions in this in the meantime? Hani bu Hollywood düğünlerinde oluyor ya. This is the only time that you are going to ask and then you are to remain silent forever. This is the moment. If there is something, uh, buyurun. Um, the, low part, the, the what part? The low part. Is it the same rate, right? Uh, this part is investment per labor, and all of it goes to cover depreciation costs. There are no net new capital accumulation. This is savings, therefore investment. This is consumption. This consumption is wages, and uh, this part must be equal to uh, the profits. All profits go to investment, but this is only depreciation costs. And all consumption is done by wages. Capitalists do not consume. Workers do not save. Okay, now let's go to uh, the second uh, idea. Here, our idea is to maximize total profits. And this is at a maximum where this sort of a thing happens, where I know that the capital labor ratio associated with this rule is less than the capital labor ratio of this rule. So I draw uh, an arbitrary, uh, arbitrary ray of 
um, total profits reaching a maximum somewhere here. This is the capital golden age. This is maximum profits. And these maximum profits go and become 0 here. R is equal to 0. And this is the pi function. <clears throat> so uh, this is my, no, this is my fifth. This is my fifth sequencing. Well, how do I get this capital labor ratio that maximizes profits? I have to use it. So I go up to the delta ray. So at that delta, I must satisfy this. So I have to choose any other saving rate. Now I am choosing a saving rate that ensures me of using this much of capital at the golden age to maximize profits. So I ch change my saving rate to S times golden age times F of K. That's my second, uh, sixth set of uh, events. SGA is less than SGR, ensuring that capital GA is less than capital GR, which ensures that the slope of the production function at this rate is higher F prime than the F prime here. F prime here is equal to delta. F prime here, which is higher, is delta plus something, all this junk. And uh, again, the same principles apply. Since we are using less capital here, we go to the production function. We, we produce less under, under the golden age. And the F prime associated there with the golden age is delta plus uh, delta minus. This F double prime, ta -ta 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 -ta, whatever this, uh, this creature is, this F double prime. This thing is steeper than the F prime here. Which means less. Output is obtained, wages will be less, but net profits will be higher. <coughs> and uh, the distances will tell me the uh, consumption and uh, investments. And you can read uh, almost everything from this diagram. Uh, whomever has invited this among neoclassic economists, it's not solo. Solo is just use, making use of it. Uh, it is not I, God forbid. But uh, uh, everyone has contributed to uh, a Newtonian harmony where all uh, 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 <coughs> sacred uh, planetary objects, consumption, depreciation, savings, investment, everything behaves nicely uh, and everything uh, is put into place. And uh, whichever rule you choose, you are at long run harmonious equilibrium. Now, uh, <coughs> starting from any non steady state, non equilibrium. Uh, value, we go towards one of these, and the economy grows. Let me very quickly uh, 
work for you, the mechanics of this thing. This is how fast the economy is growing, not capital, but output, per capita output. This is the per capita output function. And if I take the time derivative of this, the change of output over time per labor, this is equal to f prime of k times change in the capital labor ratio. That's the, uh, the chain rule. Change in output is equal to f prime times change in capital. Then uh, <coughs> divide both sides by uh, output. And output here is f of k, so I'm going to put over here f of k. And do one final trick. Multiply this and divide it by k's. Then rearrange everything. I am going to call this gamma the growth rate. Or why don't I just see the right growth rate? G, growth rate. Y dot over Y. That's the definition of G. Growth rate, rate of growth. Abbreviated by G. Is equal to what? F prime of K times K divided by F of K times K dot over K. GDP per person, $10,000 in Turkey. Output per person, gross, proportional to capital per person. So here, while capital is growing, out is growing by a proportion. Two quick questions. One, what does this expression show? Two, if I were in a Cobb-Douglas production function world, what is it equal to? 10, 9, 8, 7. Alpha, yes, the second, uh, the answer to the second question is alpha. If y is equal to, let me write, a k to the power alpha, if this is a Cobb-Douglas technology. What was the first question? But this expression, f prime times k divided by f of k. Share of, income. share of capital income in total output, in, in total product. The share in capitalist income in GDP. This is uh, f prime times k divided by f of k is share of capitalist income in total GDP. And this is the general question. If I am using a Cobb-Douglas production technology, it is equal to alpha. Does everyone see this? That is for f of k is equal to a little k to the power alpha f prime k times k divided by f of k is equal to alpha. This is not news to anyone, is it? Hani şimdi God, where that, that come from plan diyebilirsiniz. Ama yani if you just uh, uh, elaborate it for a couple of minutes. After a few glasses of whatever, uh, uh, you will figure it out. So uh, if you be 
cut the whole crap and say that, well, uh, Cobb Douglas is a very uh, nice, enjoyable, easy to use production function. Let's use it. And uh, we are saying that if we are using a Cobb Douglas technology, then output under neoclassical conditions is growing at the at this rate. So uh, suppose that the world is experiencing transition growth. Transition growth rate of. If the world is currently accumulating let's say 10% uh, uh, at a rate of 10%, if the rate of expansion of capital per labor is 10%, and if alpha is 0.5, then the per capita income in the world must be growing at 5%. If alpha is one-third, and if capital is accumulating at 10%, one-third of it is 3%. If alpha is, I don't know, uh, 0.6, if capital is accumulating, that is, if I am going here at a rate of 10%, then uh, I am going up at a rate of alpha, whatever the share of capital is, times the share of the, the growth rate of capital. Very, very handy. So that's why Cobb Douglas function is very operational. Uh, quick question. Back to our uh, golden rule thing, this SGI. Does everyone remember what is it equal to if f was indeed a Cobb Douglas production function? The saving rate. Remember, I chose the saving rate to maximize consumption. If I am using a Cobb Douglas technology, you know what this S is automatically without any F primes or whatever. Hmm? Evet. All right, it's equal to alpha. So that's another time this alpha. Uh, uh, pops out. All right, let me continue uh, with this Cobb Douglas technology then. Well, uh, uh, in equilibrium, in equilibrium, this is what I must have. S times F of K is equal to delta K. Saga continued with Cobb Douglas technology. All right, I am reverting to the specific case, very, very handy, very user friendly Cobb Douglas case. My friend, what do you want to achieve? I want to achieve the equality of investment per labor with depreciation of capital per labor. Investment being equal to savings, that's why I have used the savings function. Savings equals investment. Saving per labor is equal to depreciation of capital per labor. This is what I understand from <clears throat> long run steady state equilibrium. Well, what is your production function? This gentleman. OK, S times A k to the power alpha must be equal to delta k. Then uh, this k and one of these k's cancel out. So I must have in equilibrium s times k to the power alpha minus this time to delta. That is the steady state rule that you will be using for Cobb Douglas technology. 
Let's plot this. Now I'm going to put k here, çok geçeyim, and these bunch of numbers over here. Something must be equal to delta. Delta is a constant. 2, 1, 5, 10%, 3%, whatever. It is this thing, delta. Now let's plot this. S, 20%. A, 1 billion. 10 newtons, uh, 12 Einsteins, pure number. It is an exogenous growth model, therefore A is not allowed to change. S and A are parameters. K is a variable to the power something alpha minus 1. Alpha is a number between 0 and 1, less than 1. Therefore, alpha minus 1 is a negative thing. Therefore, this thing, whatever it is, is this type of a function. And at every instant that two lines intersect in economics, something non-trivial happens. I achieve my steady state capital labor ratio. For the specific type of a Cobb Douglas function, this is a depiction of the steady state. And it's general, just forgive me for a moment, the general story is this one. So these k's are equal. If this S happens to be the golden rule S or the golden age S, you carry out the details. But now we are concentrating on steady state. <clears throat> the difference between S times F of K minus delta K, remember, was our change in capital labor ratio rule. So continuing from this, k dot over k, which in Cobb-Douglas case is s a k to the power alpha minus delta k. Uh, pardon. Alpha to the power minus 1. The difference between the two is then uh, my <coughs> growth rate of capital. So any difference between these two lines is the growth rate of capital. This growth rate is governed by the difference between this function and the rate delta. So during the transition growth, the growth rate of capital is the difference between two two rates, which is zero under the steady state. This is the growth rate of capital. The growth rate of output is alpha times that thing. Yeah. So the growth rate is given by this difference. And the growth rate of output will be equal to alpha times these rates, which in equilibrium, it will also become 0. If you tell me the nature of these functions, I can tell you the growth rate of capital. Knowing alpha, I can also tell you the growth rate of per capita income. And thus, I can calculate the causes and nature of per capita income differences. If someone is growing fast now because it has less capital, if someone is growing at a lower rate now, because it has accumulated enough capital, 
debt economy is about to reach the steady state. All economies are moving towards a steady state where once reached there, the net growth rate will be zero. And if you are behind, you are growing fast. If you are uh, close to the steady state, you are growing slow. What is this <coughs> hypothesis called? Convergence. Convergence. And uh, that means <coughs> if you plot countries' data, right, let me do it here in a dirty and ugly way. You have capital here. You have income, level of income here. If countries have less capital, uh, sorry, why that over why here? Income growth rate and level of capital. Uh, countries that have less level, I messed it up. No. Let me do this in a proper way. Here is what convergence say. Start over. Uh, here, level of income. Here, rate of growth of income. So if you are a poor country, meaning you have poor accumulation of capital, you must be growing fast. The lower the income level, the higher must be the growth rate of income. The higher the level of income, you must have lower rate of growth. So if each dot is one country, Zambia, Ethiopia, Tanzania, uh, whatever, poor land, rich land, Japan, United States, uh, uh, I have been to Japan. It's rich, but beton yun ve chibala. Forget it. Uh, just, uh, uh, <coughs> so welfare and per capita income, different things. But we, we knew it already. Yem yeshil canım Ankara'm. Adana kebap. Yani that's, that's something else. Uh, but if convergence hypothesis makes sense, then if you take countries, look at their growth rate, and their income levels, collect them all, you must have a downward sloping line. If the neoclassical prediction of exogenous neoclassical growth, right? we have to be uh, careful. It is the exogenous thing. Uh, this is a revelation of the convergence hypothesis. I have a handout, not a homework, no panic. Bu hafta sonu derbi maçı var. Onun için you have better things uh, to, uh, to do at the weekend. Uh, this is, where did I get it from? Chapter 22 of Mankiw's book. Uh, some depiction of the ideas. Before we leave, just browse through, that's the evidence. And uh, in your careers, at a particular point in time, I am sure you will have a chance to taste, to test for a, a bunch of countries, whether convergence holds, whether not. But that's the uh, <coughs> proposition of the exogenous neoclassical world. Concentrate here, please, one crucial question. Growth rate here is definitely slowing down. Why? Engineering, mathematician. What makes the gap between the two rays to diminish and become zero, finally? Right, uh, but... Uh, uh, all right, uh, what makes this function to slope downward? 
Nije. Nasıl? Evet, ulaşıyor ama ulaşırken de eğimi azalıyor. Vay. Çok güzel. I'm asking why. Tamam, tamam anlıyorum. Yani şurada, şurada bir şeye baktınız ki bu constant, bu da constant. Tek değişen şey bu. Bu da aşağı doğru hareket ediyor. Why? Ya, alpha, alpha is less than 1. If alpha is less than 1, if I add more capital, alpha minus 1 tells me a lower number each time. Why is alpha less than 1? What does it tell me? What's the assumption be behind stating that alpha is less than 1? What makes true of f when I say alpha is less than 1? What is the assumption I am invoking? To what? Constant returns to scale. All right. That doesn't help much. Diminishing returns to capital. The inverse, when I say there are diminishing returns to capital, constant returns to scale, I mean alpha is less than 1. 1 minus alpha is also less than 1, but they add up to 1. That's constant returns to scale. But by alone, the fact that alpha is less than 1 makes the f prime of this or the change in f prime, double prime, not the other, to be diminishing returns. So the whole reason of why steady state occurs at zero growth rate is, I assume, diminishing returns to capital. And the fact that I equate margin product with f prime, which is diminishing, makes profit rate diminishing. Therefore, there is no reason to accumulate capital under the steady state because it had diminished. Well, but why? Because you have assumed so. You have assumed alpha less than 1. Well, uh, we came to this point more than once in this class. Give me a break. Assume alpha 1. What happens if I assume alpha 1? Same principles. Delta and now alpha is the one. Therefore, S times A K to the alpha becomes S times A K. Alpha is one. So it is S A times K to the power one. What's the growth rate? Why should be zero? The growth rate is the difference between S times A K curve and delta. It's constant all the time. Does it bother you? No. You have just created a perpetual, constant, endogenous growth economy. All other principles apply. F prime is equal to profits, tat, 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 tat. And since alpha is equal to 1, there are constant returns to capital. And uh, then the whole idea of making endogenous rate of growth is to assure that there are constant returns to capital, not to scale. Do something that makes returns to capital constant rather than diminishing. And on Mondays, we are going to uh, make uh, a short summary of how we can ensure constant returns to capital and then continue. <coughs> All right. With that little extended footnote, the end of the neoclassical exogenous world. E.